Welcome to the Hunt 360 Podcast. I'm Ethan <laughs> King. I'm here with the founder of Hunt 360, Jeremy Williams, and our guest, Brian Martin of Asian Mountain Outfitters. Brian, how you doing this morning? I'm good. And hey, by the way, how in the heck did you come up with the name E3? So I'm James Earl King III, so that's where the E and the three comes from. Very good. You need, you need to marry, marry royalty so you can be a, a king king. I like where you're thinking. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, he, he, you know, he, he could, I mean, he could very easily... But he, he won't. He won't make it in Britain because his accent is too strong. He's got oh, yeah. that southern drawl. <laughs> they, they may like it. They might. Yeah, they might like that. They, they got like some that. genetic. They got some new diversity in the in the royal family now. Anyway, so it might fit right in. I think yeah, he's like, he might work with a Scottish kilt. Yeah. I think the Scottish guy. He would work for Scottish. Yeah, he sort of might go with Scottish. <laughs> Maybe one of the Arab nations. <laughs> oh man, there might be a little more. That might be more he can handle there. <laughs> So Brian, tell us about uh, tell our viewers about yourself, where you come from, and uh, and what all what all you do. I come from planet Earth most days. Oh yeah, I most days. Up, most days. <laughs> I grew up in Oregon. Yeah. Um, started hunting as a young boy with my dad and his family, and then always had a lot of fun associated with hunting. You know, get done with school and sports and come home and shoot gophers. Exactly. Shoot birds hide them so the parents don't find them <laughs> <laughs> and then you know go, going into my main hunting that i started doing because you know not, not old enough hunting oregon until you're like 12 i believe back then with a big game rifle right so a lot of bird hunting 410 then 20 gauge and 12 gauge and chuckers and and, and then bb geese. guns yeah bb guns always oh yeah 22 long rifles um and then as i got older i wanted to go to like alaska or canada didn't really know anybody there so wrote started writing a few letters when i was getting ready to go to college or in college. And I uh, found a guy that had just bought an area in British Columbia when I was 19. And he said, well, come up and, and help us out for the summer and see what it's all about. So in between, uh, I went to Oregon State University in engineering and school didn't start then until the 21st or 22nd, I believe, of September. And so I could, I could take most of the hunting season because the hunting season goes until about the 10th, 15th of October then. So I could go up in mid-June and hang out for two and a half, three months. And that yeah. was my first taste of the guiding and outfitting. And then went back and did it the next year, but I took a fall semester off from engineering. And that kind of, I lost a few scholarships to do that because they said you can't break your set out, whatever, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> and so I stayed up there until the end of, almost the end of October in Canada and came back down and did a few odd jobs with my uncle and family until school started again in January. And, and then um, finished school. Then I, I, I stayed in the university, did my five year engineering and business degree, I took total. Because that taking that right. semester off, you couldn't you couldn't do it in four years then anyway. So I ended up getting a couple of minor minors to, to make up for my time, and moved to Canada after working in. I did odd guiding here and there. One one year I spent a whole summer and fall doing governor tag hunts for for sheep in the west, and that was a good that was a big opener, eye opener. You know, yeah, we did five. I think we did five governor tags and four or five standard sheep. That's crazy. And that was a lot. Yeah, that's... And then like three or four states. I did it with Elvin Hawk and Spot Country Outfitters. And I think I was 23 then. And then I moved to Montana, started doing consulting with outfitters and helping them buy and sell hunting areas and doing ranch real estate. But it really wasn't interesting for me as much because I had more hands-on. I wanted to go guiding and, and outfitting. And so I ended up buying a hunting area in Canada in 99. Um, probably should have waited and bought one in the Yukon. But back then you had to be a Yukon resident and everything and had to have... And exactly. so I ended up getting one in British Columbia. And now those areas in the Yukon that were eight, nine hundred thousand Canadian are between three and seven million Canadian. So crazy, crazy mm -hmm. difference in 20 years. Yeah. And I, I outfitted in British Columbia and through 2010. Um, but during that time, I started hunting in Asia, taking a few hunters over every year, starting in 2002. And eventually around 11, 12, I kind of phased out of Canada and went to uh, Asia and what's Central Asia. So it's not Asia like in tropical burn, you know, burn your ass we're going to have a tsunami Asia <laughs> it's freeze your ass and maybe get the snow blindness Asia which is so Central Asia is a country between Russia and, and all the countries between Russia and China yeah, like all the stands all the, the stands. infamous stands yeah. yeah and plus Mongolia but mainly so you start with Mongolia then you got Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan then you got Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and then you have Afghanistan but we don't hunt there and then you got Pakistan and so those are mainly the stands that we hunt then you go further around you go to Azerbaijan and you hunt the tour there, gotcha. and then you, the hunting in Russia is excellent. You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of like going back in time 40, 50 years. They don't have the developments and stuff they do in Alaska and Canada. So That's awesome for Western. about three days. 
What's that? I said that's pretty awesome for about three days. Yeah. Then you then you start missing your uh, your your up to date um, electricity and <laughs> water. Well, it's not bad though. I mean, Russia Russia is definitely an interesting country. It was much different than the U.S. or Canada. Yeah. So, but I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in Canada, a lot of time in the U.S., a lot of time abroad. I'm kind of like, I, I should have like three passports instead of two. Um, no, I definitely see you all over the place on your, on your Instagram, Facebook. Well, I, mean, I try and learn a lot about different places. So when I send hunters there, I know what to, what to, what to expect exactly. and what to send. So I've traveled with the guns a lot. I've traveled with a lot of gear and supplies. So I know what the hunters are going through and not assuming. I know what it's like to travel with a gun and am, ammunition and, and fly home with animals in your bag and, and check them with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and so all that stuff is handy for me giving advice to the clients because I, when I go to them the hunts I don't sit in base camp we go out and I've been a hunter and guide all my life and so I'm hunting is the easy part it's running the business keeping all the money wiring and the coordinate, coordinating the scheduling and the language barriers and stuff in all these countries that's the hard part the hunting yeah. part once you get to the field that's easy the hunting principles are the same That's, everywhere. You can shoot, you can spot, you can glass, you don't complain, you can eat any food, you don't <laughs> get bucked off the horses. You know, you can sleep in a Jeep Jeep if you're trying to catch up on sleep deprivation. If you can tolerate things that would annoy most people and laugh about them, then you can hunt anywhere in the world. That's the easy part. The, 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 the money and the logistics for the hunters are getting there. And in, in Asia, I always have a little saying that I always will find the weakness that somebody has when we go on a hunt They'll have a weakness. Everybody's going to have one or two weaknesses. Obviously, lack of experience in Asia is a given for everybody. Right. Language barrier frustrations, culture frustrations, food challenges that they don't like or they don't, you know, picky eaters. That would be me. Shooting is an issue for 80, 90% of the hunters. I mean, really, it's hard, hard shooting. Not, I'm not saying 90% miss, but I'm saying most hunters are not as good as shooters as they could be. Maybe 10% of the shooters I take are really, really, really skilled probably 30, 40, 40% are pretty good. Uh, probably 20, 30% need a lot of work and probably 20, 10 to 20% are really, really out of their element so much. So shooting is a huge thing. Fitness is an issue with, you know, I, I mean, I'm not as fit as I used to be. Um, but being mentally tough and moderately fit is better than being mentally weak and, and physically tough. All right. So those yeah, are all things you run into. Guys don't like to ride in the dark on a horse, guys, the horse horse bounces too much and you're, you know, you feel like you're not gonna have kids ever again. You're your balls and your throat. Uh, some of the saddles are a little small. The stirrups are a little high, you know, so I take extra stirrups over. You just learn what to take, and I try and in, in, inform and educate the clients. So when they go, it's, I, I, hunting Asia is like a, it's like a semi-guided do-it-yourself hunt combination. It's a hybrid hunt. If you're a guy who's used to having everything taken care of for you and going like to Africa or going on a private ranch in Colorado, um, you need to take a guy like myself or other people over. Some of my partners in Turkey, they always go with their clients. Uh, on the higher end hunts, just because things, the Western mentality is lacking in, in, in the culture of the guides over there. So if you're expecting to have the same level of surface and, service and communication that you would in a, on, a, on a normal type hunt that, like I said, in Africa or in North America, it's not gonna be there. But the game is better, in my opinion. You have more opportunities at decent animals. It's not like going on a bighorn hunt in Canada, which I've guided many. Um, those are hard. I mean, you might see one legal ram in two weeks might not see a legal ram in 10 days, and then you see one the very last day. In Asia, it's, it's not like shopping totally, but it's kind of like you get to choose. You know, okay, I, that ram's only seven, that's not shooting. You know, that ram is eight, but he's bad genetics. That ram is nine, that's, he's, he's really good, you're happy with him? Yeah, okay, that's good, let's shoot that ram. But you might, you might miss him, and you might end up shooting a smaller ram, so that's why you have to be a good shot. If you're gonna start turning down good animals, you can't afford to miss. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. usually I've only had one out of probably five to ten guys shoot a bigger one after they missed the first one. <laughs> so we had one guy two years ago that missed a couple rams in Kyrgyzstan. Was thinking he would just shoot a bad one, and they there was like a gift. I mean, they came over the hill and there was a ram kind of walking up the ridge towards him, and he just waited, and it was a 61 inch Kyrgyzstan ram. Oh which, my goodness. Which we never get them that big. You know, usually the biggest one of the year is 51, 52, 53, with a lot of high 47s. So it's just it's luck of the draw. But generally, the harder you work, the luckier you get, and the more you, and the and and, and the better your attitude ha you have, and the and the better you shoot, the bigger the animal you're going to have, also. Yeah. Yes, I mean every hunt I've gone, if you got the right attitude, and you go in it, you'll. Uh, it just seems like it always comes together. If you... Well, I, I can't think of a hunt in Asia where we didn't have an opportunity in an animal, even if it wasn't a great hunt, if the hunter stayed to it. Right. 
But we always take a little extra food, take optics for the guides. I think of, I mean, I, I take headlamps for the guides, extra batteries. I take my own radios. I take at least two forms of communication, usually a satellite phone and an in-reach now. We used to take two satellite phones that I can, so I always have one that I can text on mm -hmm. and always have one that I can call on. Gotcha. And that way, in case one system goes down, the other one's still there. Yeah. And if somebody gets hurt, you can call. You always want your insurances, like your global rescues, your ripcord, those kind of travel insurances when you go to Asia. In case, you always think worst case scenario. I, I, to me, I go hunting, I think of it like going to war. If I was going, if you were going to drop me off in Afghanistan and said, you got to get from here to here, I'm not going to go with 20 rounds of ammo, you know, and one change of batteries for my headlamp. I'm going to take extra. I'm going to be heavy. And but you'll be prepared. Yeah, but I'll... <laughs> like or you I can barter. Like, if I did right now, I'd go do. slow, but I'd be losing weight every day. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I go prepared. Like, and uh, I, I, worst case scenario, then hope for the best. Yeah, if you, you plan for the worst, you're almost always good. It's like taking a first aid kit. 90% of the time, you never need a first aid kit, but that time you cut yourself or somebody does and you got the Band-Aid, you know, you got the clotter. You, you got some uh, ana antibiotics for a blood infection, you're fine. You got eye drops for your eyes in case you get something in your eye and it gets an infection. You don't have any of that stuff. Little things like that can cost a hunt. You don't have extra shoelaces for your shoes. You don't have glue for your sole, you know, and your sole comes off. Uh, whatever. I mean, it starts to come off. There's yeah. a lot of little things. I that takes take a lot an, of experience. Too. even take an extra trigger for the guns. I take an extra scope sometimes and extra rings. Uh, people say, well, how, how come you travel so much? Because... I said, how many times have I uh, had a hunt fail because of equipment? Not yet. You know? uh, how many times do you have to use it? Probably every... No, uh, not oh. every time, but I'd rather take it and not use it. It's yeah. like a spare tire in your truck. Yeah, yeah. You, know? like, like you don't seeds. always use it, but <laughs> when you do, do, do need it. And then you waste two days of hunting trying to go round up a spare, you know, a couple tires. So. Well, I can't wait till the day I get to, uh, to head over to Tajikistan with you because I'm going at some point. So uh, I got a I got a goal, yeah. and we're going to hook up and uh, and go for Marco Polo one we'll shoot day. Shoot one of those Marco Polo or gollies, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's my that's my goal, um, and we're, we're going to do it. Um, but I do I got you know everybody I talk to about hunting Asia and um, complains or they ask about they hear the rumors of how the tipping. So the tipping tell me, is not is most of our camps tipping is not much of an issue. Um, it just kind of general sets rules of thumb. I would say if the hunt is like, let's say like a mid-Asian Ibex or a tour hunt, that's about anywhere from say seven to $11,000. Right. Most of the time I would say tip a minimum of 10%, but not more than 15% because the guides are working hard. Yep. I would say always a thousand bucks for the whole staff, not thousand dollars for the head guide. Let's say the two head guides, you know, maybe give at least 300 up to 502 max. And, but you don't want to over tip either because then they, the guys start thinking, well, only the, if you tip too much, then it makes it bad for the guys who can't afford to tip 20 or 30%. And then for the Marco Polos in Kyrgyzstan, which is technically a Humi Argali, it's like a subspecies, you know, definitely not more than 10%, but not less than 5%. So we usually that 5 for the to 10%. Whole staff. For the whole staff. So typically a good tip would be, if you tip $2,000 yeah. for a $30,000 to $35,000 hunt, that would be kind of the minimum, but not, not more than three, in my opinion. So you take so, three thousand dollars, divide it out. So typically, so, you're going to have so two your, guides. So your two guides get the majority. Then you not necessarily. The problem is everybody gives the main guides a majority, and then the cook and the helpers and the other people don't get hardly anything. You don't want to give the cook fifty bucks and your guide a thousand, especially if you're hunting in base camp every day and she's there cooking for you or he or she. So you kind of make it. So you do a group tip. Let's say the three of us, you and and, and our king over here and myself, we're all <laughs> hunting, and and we have uh, two camp staff that are cooking and cleaning. We got another helper that builds the fires and gets the water for the sauna so you, you don't smell like an old goat. And uh, we got a driver. I thought, you, I, thought, I thought that was a natural smell for so you. So let's say we have five people, plus each guy has two two people. So we would do a group tip for those people. Yep. And then you, you and I would each tip our own guides separately. You would tip your two guides, he would tip his two guides, and I would do mine. Gotcha. And so, but you don't, you don't give like one guide a thousand, the other guide 300. You know, I mean, it depends if the guy, if the guy, I also tell people if the guy's incompetent and being a, a, a jerk or lying to you, I, I just tell them right away to say, you know, uh, I always say if we, you know, if you tell guy, if you lie about the size of the animal or say it was wounded and it wasn't wounded um, or you, you know, do anything, the, the tip will reflect that. So I don't care if I, if I miss a big animal, that's my fault or your fault. But if I miss an animal because you're hitting me in the head with your hat and screaming and yelling, you know, that's not cool either. So yeah. it, it's, it's the hunter is really is responsible for himself um, for making those shots and knowing how to call the wind and everything and, yep. and having agree. a spotting scope. I never hunt without my spotting scope. If I have my rifle and 
and a tripod, I mean bipod for my gun. I have my spine scope and tripod. I, they always travel with me together. So when I'm make, calling up to the top of the hill and that's so you're the hunter, I get my spine scope on the animal. If you, and, 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 have you get, and if you don't know how to get the gun on the animal, I get the gun on the animal first, make sure we got a good spot, get you behind the gun, make sure you identify it. And then I try and watch the spine scope if, 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 it, if it's not too close. If it's really close, I don't use the spotting. That way in case you miss or hit him, I can, I, I'll film with my phone and I can see where he's hit, and I know if it's a liver shot or a gut shot or ass shot or whatever. So you're and filming through the spotting scope? All the time, yeah, yeah, I use a phone cam. Yeah, these uh, the videos you send me from, uh, for these yeah. sheep are just incredible. You know? And that's really key, all these little things like that. Yeah, that is really, it, it, I mean, that, that is key. Then you then the hunter really uh -huh. knows it up front. Uh -huh. like, uh, yeah, I, we don't have any, well, he hit it, he didn't yeah. know it. He hit the horn, that stuff to fly off, that was part of the horn, that wasn't hair. Right. You know, we've done that before. This year we saw a guy shot right over the top of the back, clipped the hair, clipped the horn, and there was a big dust cloud. So I don't know where he hit. I just could tell something happened. And we looked back, the ram, it was, so what I saw back on the end was part of the horn flying back and hitting hitting the hair on the back of the animal. So the animal was not hit really. I mean, he just clipped the horn at the half curl point. Oh. And that made a big dust cloud though. And you don't know, it's like, you know, cause you hit him in the side, you'll have a dust cloud too. So all these little things like that help, anything you can do. Um, but a lot of hunters go to Asia, they're on a budget. They, you know, they, if you're gonna hunt Ibex and Truri, you're not gonna have a guy like me along. It's, it's too expensive. I charge extra when I go on these hunts. Um, so. But usually the guys that go and tour and Ibex hunting are more do-it-yourself type hunters and know how to take care of themselves. It is have the language barrier issue. The other trick is you download uh, the Russian Google to your phone, the, 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 the offline version. And then when you're out there, you can text and, and, and make sure you put down the Russian keyboard for them to text. And then you can uh, communicate on quick things. Wow, that's a, cool, that's a, that's a really yeah. cool tip there. And the other thing is with taxidermy, make sure you understand how to skin they know how to skin and get off the animal, but sometimes their ability to turn the nose and the eyes and the ears and get the last foot joint out and the tail out, they're not as good as I would like. And uh, so make sure you know how to do that when you hunt Asia so you can um, help the guide prepare. Make sure they have fine salt. Make sure they salt everything really well. If there's a lot of blood in the skin, I take the skin down to the, if there's a running creek, right. I take it down and wash it physically. Wash it. They don't like doing it. I said, well, how are we gonna dry it? I said, it doesn't matter. I said, there's solid blood. And you're gonna have a you'll golden. Ruin it. You're gonna have a. You no, know, we'll ruin the skin, but you'll have a golden, yep. a reddish tinge to your. You won't be white on the mane. Exactly. So then you and I take our rain gear on. We'll take it down. Then we shake it off, just like you're shaking a dog, or a rag. You shake it, shake it, shake it, and then I'll uh, finish yeah, flushing. It. Then I'll finish flushing <laughs> it. You want to do that before you put it in the heat. Like you don't. If you take it in the house and that blood sets in, it's hard to get out. Yeah. If you don't have that, you take a tub and a scrub brush or whatever, whatever it takes, and then a couple rinses with some soap and water and get. And it's a pain in the ass, but it makes it look way nicer. Well, Shake agree. it out, and then you, you flush it. Put my rain pants on. I flush it, and then I salt the crap out of it. Was really fine salt. Then I, but don't put it back in the freezing temperature. Take it. In, I mean, take it inside my room in the in the, in the house, and I put it in a, a garbage bag, and um, and that works really well. well. But I put it inside a canvas bag inside. So when I travel, I always have labeling stuff for all my all the hunter skins and the horns, because that's really, you can get skins mixed up. Um, label everything really well. Make sure everything's salted. Make sure you know how to the, remove the wet salt, put dry, more salt on. And in most of the countries now, you can't take the animals home because of the permits and the CITES and everything. So the, the CITES system is in theory, in theory it's a good idea, but in reality it's, it, it costs everybody time and money. And because, because it's, um, when you have the CITES, it takes longer. You have to get the U.S. CITES import permit before you can bring it home. It's more expensive for them to get an export CITES. Might take them a few days, or so you aren't going to be able to take the trophies home as much now. So it, it makes the hunts more expensive. And yeah. it is well, more how long does it normally take to get your trophies home? Anywhere from three to, to six months is normal. And it could t I tell hunters it could take up to a year in some places. So I t don't panic about it. Make that's why it's really important to do a great job on the skinning and salting, right. so it's fine. Right? Once yes. you get it salted and dried for a couple of days in proper conditions, they really have to work at it to screw it up. They have to get it in wet conditions or freezing and thawing all the time or get bugs on it. So did different countries have different time, like if, say if the difference between Mongolia and uh, Tajikistan, About is it still the same time frame, six months to a year to get your impression? Pretty back? much, there's almost nothing that's less than a month or two. A few places might be one or two months, but you gotta make sure when they ship it that it's not damp. Yeah. Yeah, but that's no way you can. They, they know you just don't wrap it. And you don't put any skins in plastic when you ship them. 
Gotcha. Always keep it in canvas and in cardboard and wood, something that breathes in case it gets stuck in a warehouse and it gets above freezing, you know, not a big deal. Yeah. You want to ship it where if it sat there for three months, it would be fine. Yeah, it won't get humidity in it yep. and, and ruin it. And you make sure that when they ship it, all the paperwork's been approved by the U.S. broker so that when, when it comes, they know that, okay, we've proven it's in your name, spelled correctly, the right address, the right paperwork, you know, because once it's shipped, then if there's a problem, it has to be either re-exported or it can be seized. Gotcha. So that's very important. Never assume anything. Never assume you're going zero. To always verify. Make sure your scope is tight. Make sure your your action screws are torqued down. Uh, make sure your reticle is moving when you move it. You know. Make sure your animal is skinned. All these things make Asia hunting great. If you don't do that, if you assume you that, or you better take somebody like myself with you. Well, and I agree. Then, I mean, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not, I'm taking somebody that knows. So I'm taking yeah. you with me. So <laughs> yeah. when, the, when the time comes, I mean, I'm, I mean, this is why I love talking to you. I mean, you have so much knowledge of. Not only, I mean, just everything. I mean, me and you have a lot of, a lot. Of, we have a, this visionary mind that likes yeah. details. And uh, yeah, no, you. I really followed you for what you've done the last couple of years here. And uh, when you started out with our Golly Nation, now you went to Hunt 360. And but you've always been a passionate guy. Oh yeah, hard worker. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe it. these guys say you're paying the ass, but yeah. overall you've been good. <laughs> well, E3 is a hard worker as well. I mean, that's why he's on our team. He he yeah. uh, he he's done very well um, helping us build the platform we have yeah so it's come along really good we still have well, hopefully you know we have years and years more to go oh, yeah. but uh it's just it's amazing how fast it, things grow once you get a foundation started yeah. it can multiply yeah. so much faster and, and and that's the point where we're now starting to see our content starting to really the yeah, content is important but also trying to mo i mean you still and businesses still have to make a profit so oh, yeah you know, same thing in the hunting business. A lot of guys are looking for deals, right? They go online and try and work directly with local guys, and they don't sometimes get the right information. So going and trying and finding a deal, you're basically paying for information. Yep. When you're working with a good agency, uh, you're working with a good outfitter, and he charges a little bit more. It may not be his, I mean, he's still got to buy the food and the horses, but it's the information you get. You're prepaying for the education. The education, the information. So when you get over there, it's kind of like what you expected and not a total getting caught with your pants down. A lot yeah. of guys go to Asia and get out with their pants down. Oh, yeah, and they get, they get hammered, too. I mean, if you actually heard the stories that happens over there, most of them are preventable. Most of them are preventable. But on, there's not a lot of truly skilled hunters. And so you go into an environment like that as a, not a very tr truly skilled hunter. You better have a good local guide that knows what he's doing. And But you still got to shoot the animal. You, still, you, know, you can't miss. You still got to ride the horse. You still got to walk the mountain. <laughs> so it requires a lot of skills that a lot of people uh, are short on. Well, that's what uh, E3 would be good for. He could climb those mountains a lot, uh, a lot better than I can. I'm, you know, he's half my age, so. Age is important. I mean, age. You can't, you can't fight age, but you can keep the, you can keep the weight down, and you can keep the heart strong and, yeah. and eat a good diet and everything else. It's the mental, the mental. The mental to a certain extent, but I noticed. I mean, I used to cr be critical of my older hunters. I come up, what's wrong with you guys, right? Um, but now as I get older, you realize that there are things that happen that are beyond your control. Old in knee injuries, old hip injuries. Yep. I had cowboys that did, used to ride bulls that had have new hips and new knees and guys that played a lot of football. And there's just people that have bad genetics and they get arthritis early and some people have bad hearts. I mean, but the thing is in the hunting business, some people need to also re re understand their limitations and not have such high expectations. To, you know, if, if you can't hike and you can't shoot and you want a 60 inch ram, you know, that that's yeah. putting everybody in a really difficult situation. And unless you just get gifted, and that, yeah. you can't you can't go into a hunt hoping for a gift. Yeah. I mean, a gift is a gift, not a yeah. expectation. So, but I agree. It, the mental, the mental preparedness is what people don't understand. Mental is mean, everything. That's why Navy SEALs. There's a certain type of guy. I mean, they're all physical, but they'll they'll take a mentally solid, stable high integrity guy over a guy who's a better athlete because that better athlete guy may not be able to grind it out every day. Yeah. And I can, and I've been on some hunts myself that were like, you know, after a week, you're like, oh my God, you know, it's just, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> you know, your, your mind starts playing with you, you know, yeah. and you got to break that. You and you have to, yeah. And you have to be goal oriented, but not crazy goal oriented. And honey, you have to be somewhat flexible. <clears throat> and I know guys who have a checklist of everything they got to kill, and they got to kill five animals this year. And if they don't do this, if it doesn't make SCI, if it's not 58 inches, if it's you know if it's not a gold medal, it's like a disaster. No, you can't hunt that way. That's, it's okay to have a goal and set big aspirations, but if it's a checklist, I mean, hunting is too many variables. Yeah, that 
you know, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, you need to go enjoy the experience and, uh, and take what, 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 uh, what we're gifted with or, or our opportunities. Yeah. I mean, you can be, like you say, somewhat goal in your art, you know, have goals, but don't, uh, don't let it be a disaster. Yeah. Well, if, if you don't if have you goals in life, typically what's that say? Fail the plan and, and plan to fail. Oh, yeah. But you, you, your goal is, you, sometimes people have the wrong goals, and that's why trophy hunters have a bad reputation is because 100 people don't understand it, but everybody is a trophy hunter if you're a hunter at the end of the day. I mean, you might not, we say you like the meat, yeah, but if you had a six-point bull elk and a five-point bull elk, and the six points 350 and the five points 290, I said 99% of the hunters, given the same opportunity, the same price, the same situation, will shoot the six point. Yep. Right? If you had a chance, let's say you're 25 years old and you're looking to get married, you're probably not going to probably date a girl who's 5'1 and 160 pounds if you met somebody who's 5'8 and can hike with you and go hunting with you, right? I mean, you're going to make a choice. You're going to choose somebody who's more athletic and more compatible with you. You're going to choose to live in a nice house versus a trailer house if you can afford the nice house. You're going to drive a newer truck with proper tires versus an old Volkswagen, you know, uh, you know, the greenie vans, if you can afford it. So, I mean, we're all trophy hunters. The problem is that the way people look at trophy hunting and, and the way they talk about it, people just don't understand. They're just ignorant. I mean, everybody's a trophy hunter if you if you're, have any aspirations at all in life. Exactly. Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. You just you don't know, want to make the, tro- the size of the animal dictate the attitude. Exactly. And if you don't like the animal, don't shoot it. The worst thing you do is shoot it and they get pissed off. Ah, it's not as big as I wanted, right? Then don't shoot it. Yeah. Go home without one. And if you have to kill one, you know, go on game farm hunts or, or lower your standards, you know? You're right. That's hard to explain to some people. So some people, hunting brings out the best and worst in a person. I've seen guys that you think would never be able to do it. And I've seen guys that are really amazing hunters, but when something goes and go their way, they're blaming people, they're pissed off. And you see that, you kind of see like the devil side come out in people. And the other people have a very nice, well, don't worry about it, man. I screwed up. I'll, next time we'll get one. Yeah. So, so what about moving into like, these hunts are very expensive. People that are younger, how, how can they, they plan and get involved to, to get a hunt? Simple. If you're 18 years old, um, you should not be worrying about how many tattoos and women you can bang. You probably should be worrying about... Uh, you know, looking at careers that will pay enough that you can do this kind of stuff and give you the time to do it. You know, if you want to be a school teacher, great, but then don't have an aspiration to be a Marco Polo hunter. So you got to choose, you got to match your career and your income with this. You got to have time and money. Very few people have all three a, a, a career, money, and a family. It's hard to, or a hobby, let's say. So you can have a lot of money and a great career, but you might not have time to go hunting. Or you might, and have a family. So it's hard to have all three. So if you want all three, you better start planning well and get lucky. Wow. That's, uh, that tells you right to the point, don't it? Yeah, it's not very encouraging for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, E3's going to be all right. Yeah. We're going to, you know, hit, the Hunt 360 is going to excel. Then we'll, you could uh, always, like, work at a, if you, get, you got good genetics, you can always work at a sperm bank or something like that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, so how did you get your foot in the door starting over there in Asia? I just went. I had a client that had been to Asia. He said the local outfitter needed some more hunters. He gave me his, uh, one of his kids' names, I think his son and his daughter, spoke a little bit of English. And we wrote emails, made a plan, and I found a hunter that was willing to go. And he knew I was a good hunter, but I didn't know him. We had mutual friends, and we went together, and, and he shot an Ibex and a Marco Polo. But that was a really eye-opener. We had an equipment issue right off the get-go. He had a uh, Swarovski Professional Series scope with the target turrets on it and the aluminum gun case. Well, the aluminum gun case and all the traveling, and you got the target turret that's pointed up against the gun case, and it got smashed into the scope, and you couldn't oh, wow. undo it, and it knocked the scope off, and we couldn't. We had to actually file it off with a file on a Leatherman tool to get the cap off, and we couldn't adjust the scope anymore. So it, luckily, and I don't really like these mounts, but he had the double, he had the single dovetail on the front, and then the windage on the back of the Leopold, and we had to adjust the horizontal with the um, with the with the screwdriver screws. And um, we got it enough to kill a couple Ibex. Um, and we're, I said, we're not, I, the, my nickname over there was Brian No Big because I wouldn't let him shoot anything. I, I, I was, I probably seen too many Tajikistan Rams. And I'm thinking we're going to shoot at 55 and we're in Kyrgyzstan. And this area is normally a good high 40s to low 50s. I turned down many of those and I finally found two mid, mid to upper 50s Rams. And his, that morning he'd fallen on the ice getting off the horse and he'd hit the, he figured he must have hit his gun and then knocked it off again. So when he shot, I remember the part of the horn of the ram blew off at 325. 
And so his gun was off about two, two and a half feet at 325 instead of, at, normally it would have been off about six inches. We couldn't get it perfect, but anyway, so that was my first experience. And then we missed another one. Then finally we killed one right at, right at dark the last day. Wow. So we had to, he had to hold on the, he had to hold on the ass, past the ass, like a foot past the ass to hit it. Man, what an experience. Yeah. I mean, that's continued from there. Yeah. And then I've just taken more hunters over every year. And um, this year I spent probably three, three and a half months in Russia and Asia and everything. I was in, I was in Azerbaijan, Spain, um, Russia, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. Um, took some guys to New Zealand, took some guys to Texas for Audad. I'm trying to also get guys getting mountain hunting experience, you know, other places where it's a little easier for them, like Texas and, and New Zealand and encouraging guys to go there also in the off season. Um, and getting mountain time underneath them and making sure their shooting is good. And then, you know, getting them into Asia or guys that um, want to have hunting something in the off season. Asia is the same hemisphere as we are. So you can't really hunt much in March or April. You can, but the skins are not very good. Right. So like in New Zealand, you can do that. You can hunt Texas and stuff in February and March, you know, so you can increase your hunting season. The Texas all dads are so fun, hunt. and um, they're I mean, fun. And I don't really go down there and guide them. That's not my purpose to go to New Zealand, just to kind of revisit and make sure some of the camps and meet with some of the guys and you know, send a few guys there. But my main focus is the Marco Polo, the Ibex, the Argales, you know, those kind of animals in uh, in Central Asia, wow. the tour hunting. I prefer. I mean, I like working with all types of hunters as long as they have the right attitude. It but is, hunting is a very personal thing for me, so I will only guide certain people. Yeah, it's really a, it's really it's really exciting to um to hunt with a hunter that's that's open minded and has the right yeah drive and mm -hmm. passion. I mean, it's, it's exciting to, to be around. But even working with people, just in general, if you get if you share the same passions and oh, exactly whether it's farming like you did right. or anything, it's fun to work with somebody who likes it. Yeah, it is. It yeah, is. And you don't want to go in the hunting business if you don't like it, but. Just because you're good at hunting doesn't mean you should go in the hunting business either. No, you got to be good in business. Yeah. Just in business general. Exactly. Because <laughs> if, uh, if you if you just want to be a hunter and uh, want to get in the hunting business, man, it's tough. It's real it's tough. tough. And you also, a lot of people don't have the personality, you know, or the temperament to deal with clients. Yeah. So, like, you guys, are, you, you guys aren't guiding. You guys are providing information and content. Yeah, so we don't... Yeah, you're exactly right. I don't have to be hands-on with... Yeah. with 50 different clients with 50 different yeah. types of mentalities and, yeah. and that would be very difficult yeah because um, an outfitter is providing both a service and a product yeah they are and time and I then mean, the day was, if somebody pays $50,000 they consider it a product yep you know if you pay $3,000 it's more of a service <laughs> but guy, you know, those guys let's say if a guy those saved, saved two years ago Ibex hunting that hunt costs more to him than it does a guy who has a big business and goes Marco Polo hunting and does two or three hunts like that a year so you just because the guy doesn't pay as much money doesn't mean it's not as important to him or as a percentage of the income, it's even higher. Because no. that's not really just his disposable income. He's sacrificing. Maybe he's eating Pop-Tarts and, and Top Ramen instead of steak and sushi so he can go on an Ibex hunt. Or the other guy who goes on an Argali and a Markor hunt, you know, it's like he can do a couple of those a year and it, he still eats the same and lives in the same house. The other guy drives an old beater truck just so he can go Ibex hunting or tour hunting. I just so, want to make it clear that it's me. I drive an old nothing yeah. and, uh, and sacrifice. I don't eat Pop-Tarts, but I do uh, I know. I do eat pretty rough <laughs> though. <laughs> but by general, you're a little rough guy. You gotta be a little bit rough to do. I sacrifice, I'm yeah. a sacrifice. I mean, Eve 32, we sacrifice to grow this company and uh, yeah. to make it so we can eventually yeah. get to that point where we can do those things. So, and it's just, it is, it's been a long three years so far sacrifice. Well, I'm sure you'll be successful because most guys will quit after a year or two. Yeah, well, I don't. I have no quit in my mind. There, I will not. You're quit. You're like an old wild boar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rooting for that next nut. Yeah, I hear you. So hopefully it'll be a big one. <laughs> exactly. You want a big nut with a big yeah. root, so you don't have to go uh, scavenging for another day or two. That's right. No, I know. I, I I've always appreciated our friendship, and uh, uh, you know, we we have a lot of stuff in common. Um, you know, with you know hunting and how we grew up. I grew up on a farm, also. I didn't know that. Yeah, I grew up on a wheat farm. Yeah, cattle took 4-H and FFA animals to the shows all my life. I did too. I grew up yeah. in FFA and uh, did show animals, and uh, I was president of our FFA chapter for yep. 
three years, I think. Uh, I feared you were one of those guys. <laughs> Probably <laughs> no, did the soil judging and the cattle judging, and did you do the welding. And I didn't. Do, yeah, I did. I didn't do the cattle, but I did the welding. I did the yeah. sheep. I did the hogs. I did um. I did all that stuff. With the work, I did all that. I mean, mm -hmm. I loved it. I mean, it, it brought, it built a, it built a foundation in my yeah. life at that time. Yeah. It was, um, yeah. and I and I still use those some of those things. No, today. you do. It, it gives you grant. You, you understand the value of life and death dealing with livestock. I mean, most people, I mean, people are just a predator. I mean, really, we're predators and we're food yeah, we're source. Top of the chain. And if we don't have a gun, we don't have a bow, we become a food source. <laughs> yeah. You know, basically, things with eyes are food sources at, yeah. at the end of the day. Something's going to eat you. It's an organic product. You know, whether it's a maggot or a, or a grizzly bear or, a, you know, a lion, somebody's going to eat, eat, eat you. <laughs> Hopefully, it won't be a grizzly bear or a lion. <laughs> Hopefully and that not. you're for 375 or 416 does the job. Man. But it's hard to explain hunting to somebody. It's like trying to I'm trying to explain hunting to somebody. It's like trying to explain, explain sex to a blind monk with no hands and an erectile dysfunction. <laughs> and how do you explain that? You can't, uh, really. And so, so everybody has an opinion about hunting. It's terrible and mean. They've never done it. So, I mean, I, I have a little funny saying. Um, I said, I'll quit sport hunting when you quit sport humping. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a good thing. That's good. I take my son and, um, you know, I'm trying to pass on Well, mm -hmm. I have, I already have. I mean, I can see him desire that he wants to do it now. And, uh, you know, and, and, but I can see other kids who don't, um, get to go and uh, they, they don't, they don't understand it, but no, you don't know. Unless you actually go hunting, it's hard to explain. Right. Like I said, how do you explain sex to somebody? How do you explain what it's like to ride in an Indy car? You know, you, you rode on a, you know, a tricycle and then you ride in a bicycle and then you get in a Volkswagen bug. How do you how do you explain what it's like to ride in a Ferrari? Yeah. You're a Bugatti Veyron. You that's what it's like it. to see a Marco Polo versus like going out and shooting squirrels. Like it's crazy. How do you explain it to somebody? And then the thrill and the chase and shooting you right before dark and packing out. Those are like life changing experiences for people. I've had people who said their stone sheep hunt was as important to them, you know, and maybe it sounds crazy as their firstborn child was. They remember it as much as they having their first child. So I have a brown bear experience that I remember like it was yesterday, and um, and it. I mean, it was one of my, it was a long, I spent 40 days hunting for brown bear. And, um, it, you know, I shot, and I was able to get a 10 foot coastal brown bear and um, at like seven yards. So it's standing up with looking a rifle. at me with a rifle. And, uh, you know, it was uh, it was an experience that I'll never, I'll never forget it. Cause it was, just, it does rank up there with watching my son, now, there's nothing that beats my two children being born, you know, watching that experience and emotions. But I'm gonna tell you, that brown bear experience, the memory of it, it was right like up there. piece by piece by piece, I remember every detail of it because mm -hmm. it was etched in my mind. From, I mean, it, it, was, it was crazy from sleeping in the hide, in the rain, trying to pack it out. I mean, hiking three miles to the ocean, getting a boat. I mean, it was just a- Was no that food. Peninsula or Kodiak? It was, it was out on the peninsula, out yeah. near Sandpoint. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a, it, it, I ain't gonna say it was brutal. I mean, it was, it was, it was tough, but it, it, it was- hunting is not really what you would call enjoyable a day in and day out. No, it wasn't, it was not enjoy, the experience, the- It's memorable, that, but not necessarily enjoyable. That one hour of stalking and getting up on it and, uh, and doing the harvest and then that was so adrenaline rush. It was unbelievable. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, you can't describe when you see a 1500 pound animal standing there that can just eat you i oh, mean yes. with ease i mean there's nothing if, yeah. if he was to get a hold of you there's uh -huh. you're done exactly but it was um it was quite a quite an experience for me and then i just did one with my son for a mule deer hunt and it will be it how old's your son now uh, he's 13. yeah so he was able to draw a youth mule deer tag this mm -hmm. year and um on a, for a youth hunt and uh, it was a, a rut mule deer hunt northern New Mexico right on the Colorado line and, and we hiked in several miles before daylight and hike out several miles after dark mm -hmm. go back in the next day I mean, we chased this deer all over to this plateau before we finally able to get him right before dark on the second day of uh, second day after we found the deer about maybe the fourth day of our actual hunt but anyway the motions that you get as a father watching your child um, do that is um, and spend the physical, you know, watching him climb these mountains and mm -hmm. you know, and outdoing a 13 year old outdoing you is, of course, you know, they have the drive, they can just go, go, oh, yeah. go, but 
It's a, it's, it's awesome to watch. He just doesn't have any, the experience. He needs your guidance, and you oh, need yeah. his enthusiasm. Oh, he, yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, E3 was uh, got to witness it with us. He he tagged along, did a whole hunt with us, and uh, Good. it was a very uh, very educational for and emotional for all of us, to be honest. And we got a great video of it, and we'll have we'll have video out for long so we can share it for everybody to watch. But it's cool, like you were talking about having the great gear. To you know, you got to have the great products, the great gear. Because one little thing can just ruin a trip, just like you said. No matter where you go, um, well, you can control your gear, and you got to control the variables that you can control. Yeah, your attitude, your gear. You can't control the weather. Uh, you can't necessarily control, uh, you know, other things, horse accidents, um, animals maybe not being in the area like you wanted. You can't control what local guide you're going to get, but you can. You if can you control, control the things you can. You, you can control, control yourself and. Yeah. The, and the things but you can i mean like i say I, I have an injury in my knee as well from years ago on a doll sheep hunt and um it still bothers me today after 20 years mm -hmm. and uh, as soon as i start going downhill on these mountains it, it just starts oh yeah festering and uh it'll do it and it, it just but but i put you know i push through it and, oh yeah but you have to oh, yeah. if you want to watch if you want to succeed oh, yeah. and, and uh those if you set those goals like you said you, you, you got to have goals in life and you know everybody if, the goal-driven people, they succeed. And um, you, of course, you, you always have these fails. You know, we all do, And but you don't give up. You just keep on rolling. And that well, there's a saying that the wise people, I mean, smart people learn from the, their own mistakes. Wise people learn from the mistakes of others. Yeah. So you got to, but sometimes it doesn't really sink in until you actually have your own failure. You don't really appreciate it until you have a failure. Yeah, and when you have a, a failure, especially big failures, I've had some big, big, failures and plenty of small failures but now i'm starting to i say okay i don't want no more failures like these so i'll start paying attention to the i'm, I'm becoming more the wise man you mm -hmm. know like you just mentioned i started mm -hmm. watching other people's failures and start yeah okay maybe i can skirt around some of this by not doing what that exactly <laughs> that education that just was taught and so and it, and it goes, goes for these hunting trips i mean you uh you become wise and start Associating with people like yourself to um, that, that has the experience, you know, this is my wise decision is when I go to Marco Polo hunting, I'm going to take, I'm going with Brian because I, I don't want to be the person that gets another education. I'm going to make that wise decision and, and take you right along with me, or I'm going to go right along with you. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, well, hopefully you get to do that in the next couple of years. Oh, I am. I'm going to. Yeah. I'm, I, I, like I say, you set those goals and you do what it takes to make it happen. You don't quit. So, of course, you can't see them, forget, you know, the unseen, but um, you got to work with the rest, though. Oh, definitely. So, well, it was great having you here this morning, man. I've, uh, it, our friendship is, uh, is strong, and uh, I really appreciate, oh, you're appreciate welcome. it. I always wish you best with your business, and I need to, I, I, I've been gone so much, I need to get signed up in your program, too, and, and uh, try it out. Oh, that's awesome, and it's growing so fast as well. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you got to. You got to get going here. So. I know. <laughs> I've been gone all, all but a few days here and there for the last many months. Yeah. You'd change your name in the time that I was gone. Yeah. So, we, you know, we rebranded it to get better SEO. You yeah. know, for, you know, we just, we needed a good way to, for people to find us. And, you know, it just works yeah. better. Yeah. So. That was good. I like it. You guys oh. are doing the right thing. Well, I appreciate it, sir. All right. Well, you guys have a wonderful show get back to the booth and, and uh, start yapping with people here when the show starts in another 45 minutes. Yeah, well, go make, uh, go make some connections, man. Sounds good. And a lot of times at these shows is actually connecting with uh, good past co connections also, past yep. clients. And I agree. Still, if you, if you, but it's important to have the internet presence because there's a lot of hunters that can't go to these shows. Young hunters are busy and family, and so you need to ha go to the shows, but you also need an online presence. And Not only that, but it's just up. education. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we can educate people. On, online there's so many people going to it they can find they can find it online so much faster oh i know uh, you know educate themselves exactly so anyway you take thank care you. of my friend thank you brian thank you very much thank you thank e3 you. nice getting to know you better yeah. <laughs>